this with me. Say, Lord Jesus, speak to my heart. Change my life. In Jesus' name. Father, I pray for a spirit of revelation to minister to every one of us. Enlighten the eyes of our understanding. May there be a flame of heaven that engulfs our thinking and our minds so that our minds are transformed by your word. In Jesus' name. If you agree with that, somebody say amen. God bless you as you're seated. I want you to go to Judges chapter 6. I'm going to talk to you about 20 minutes. 20 minutes. I want to talk to you around this thought, transitions. Say that with me. Say transitions. Transitions. Or a transition is what we're in the body of Christ right now. If there's anything that's been revealed over the last several years about the Church of America or the Western Church, is that many people, self confessing, professing Christians, were really professing Christians in name only. There was a lack of substance and power. People were easily victimized, manipulated, controlled. People's lives have gone down rather than going up, taken captive by addiction conditions. Marriages have been destroyed at an accelerated rate over the last several years. Suicide has skyrocketed. People dying of fentanyl and overdosing has become a massive epidemic problem in our country and in our culture. You look at a lot of people that say, I'm Christians, but yet when turbulence hit, and trials hit, problems hit, they quickly fell away. Before the pandemic, the average Christian Averaged going to church two times a month, according to George Barna, the church statistic that people, statistic guy that most people respect, who's very thorough in his research. This side of the pandemic, the average Christian now goes to church one time a month. And I used to say a once a week Christian will make a weak Christian, a part time Christian will never be able to, to defeat a full-time devil. And something's wrong. Something's wrong when it seems as if the devil is able just to run people over, run families over, run churches over, take over certain situations. Something's wrong with that. When I read the Bible, even in the Old Testament, you see how they were victorious in battle how they were able to escape the edge of a sword, thrown into a lion's den, but a lion wasn't even able to touch them. Thrown into fiery furnaces and God protect them. In the New Testament, you see them ending up shipwrecked on islands, but yet snakes jump out and bite them and can't kill them and an awakening happens and an entire island gets saved. See that in the Bible, but yeah, you look around the church and you wonder, where is it? And then if somebody operates the way we're operating, miracles happening, words of knowledge happening, prophetic flows happening. People say, they're weird, they're strange. And they're trying to measure our faith by their powerless Christianity. Versus the scripture. They study the scripture because in it they think they find life. But Jesus said, but yet they don't come to me that they might have life. They do their devotions. They read their Bibles. They stand as professors in seminaries and teach theology. But yet they don't come to him so that they might have what the Bible says they can have. They read the book of Acts like it's a history lesson, not realizing that it's instructions and commandments to a lifestyle that if we do it, if we live it, we'll get the results. 
people approach their Christianity and God like he's some tool to be used to give them the dream that they dream of. That if I give my life to God, he'll give me the dream that I've always wanted. He'll give me the life that I've always wanted. He'll give me the house I wanted, the picket fence I wanted, the spouse I wanted, the career I wanted, the finances I wanted. He'll give me all the things that I wanted. Never to consider the fact that we're to surrender to his will and not ours. People just added God to their life. And when turbulence hit and trials hit, persecution hit, it wrecked their theology and concept about God because they knew about him, but they didn't really have an intimate relationship with him. Or if they did, it was just so shallow that when the tribulation arose like the sun, it withered away quickly because it had no root within itself. My job is to help disciple you, empower you, But before anything can change, and maybe that's where you are right now, feeling powerless over certain situations. Because he's given us authority. He's told us to subdue, have dominion. And the first thing we have to learn to rule and to reign over is this body that we live in. It's this mind that we have. It's his brain that we possess. It's not to be controlling you. You're to be controlling it. And so in Gideon, did I tell you to go to Judges? Judges chapter six. Okay, here I come. In verse 11, it describes Gideon in the wine press. He was threshing wheat. Trying to not get caught. Verse 11. He threshed wheat in the wine press in order to hide it or hide from the Midianites. The Midianites had partnered with another group of people to come against Israel. They were much more powerful than them. They were living under these harsh conditions, having an adversary that wanted to destroy them. Similar to today, Hamas wanting to destroy Israel. It saddens me over what's happening in some of the universities of America, Harvard, some of the marches that are taking place in the major cities of America that are anti-Israel, anti-Jew. It is evil. You know the reason that people hate Jews so much and don't really even know why they hate them so much is because they're God's chosen people. They're God's representative people on the planet. I didn't just make that up. Your Bible says that. Does that mean we don't care about people that are Palestinians or things like that? That doesn't mean that, but we stick with scripture. If you ever had one shred of blessing on your life, One quick way to lose that blessing is to start cursing Israel. Start cursing a Jew. Because God said, I will bless those that bless Israel. And I will curse those that curse Israel. We stick with scripture. Even when it's unpopular. That's why so many couldn't stand and don't stand because they don't have the wherewithal within them. They've not abandoned all to Jesus. They were just trying to use God for their convenience, not realizing I got to surrender and serve him when it's good and when it's not good, when it's easy and when it's tough, when I'm on the mountaintop or whether I'm going through the valley where people are celebrating my faith or coming against me because of my faith. And so in this situation, Gideon's hiding. That's the last place we want to be right now. Hiding. Hiding from some kind of enemy. Hiding from the culture or the demons that are controlling culture or the voices or what somebody's saying on social media or mainstream television. I don't even watch TV. I don't care to hear what they have to say. And we're more influenced by that. We're intimidated to serve God because of all those voices. And so Gideon's threshing wheat 
Now, threshing wheat means they're beating wheat. They're separating the chaff from the wheat so that they can make bread. He's beating it. It's being beaten to separate what is not usable from what is usable, from what is not needed so that you can get what is needed. They're beating it. That's what he's doing. He's beating it. That's threshing. He's actually doing to the wheat what's happening to him. The conditions of his world are putting a beating on him. The threshing that we've gone through, the sifting. Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. The sifting. But Jesus said, I pray for you that your faith doesn't fail you. The sifting that is taking place is to separate what you don't need from what you do need. To get rid of the people that are really not with you so that those that are with you can go where I'm taking you. The things that you picked up in life that you thought you needed but you really don't need. It's a transitional moment where we're separating the unusable so that we know what we have that is usable for the future. It's a beating. Even God uses your enemies. God doesn't necessarily send your enemies, but he uses your enemies. Matthew chapter four, Jesus told Satan when he came to try to tempt him three different times, Jesus responded to him when he said, I want you to bow down and worship me and I'll give it all to you. One translation, Jesus replies to him, says, it is written, even you shall serve. The purpose of God why God can take what the enemy meant for harm and turn it around and use it for good. Sometimes the attack of the enemy is something that God uses to wake up a sleeping giant, to wake up those that need to be woken up. I can look back over my life, some of the battles I faced, I wasn't happy from the battle, but the battle put a fight on the inside of me. I can look back and see where had that not happened, I wouldn't have risen up the way I rose up. I wouldn't have fought the way that I fought. I explained this years ago, the difference between peacetime and wartime. Most people in Western church culture were used to serving God in what I call peacetime. Peacetime in the military, you have long runways to follow instructions. You're shining jeeps and polishing boots. You're keeping your equipment, your gun, all broken down and oiled and ready. You're not pulling triggers necessarily. But when wartime breaks out, everything changes. The sentences get shorter. The outcome of decisions are greater. What you do in wartime is so much more important than what you do in peacetime. Most people fail to prepare properly in peacetime. That's why they weren't ready for wartime. And so Gideon is hiding, threshing this wheat, going through the very process that the wheat itself is going through. And an angel shows up. I've talked a lot about angels over the last year. As we continue to move in this end time culture, in the kingdom, those that are really walking upright with God, honoring, reverencing, respecting him, angel assistant will become more prevalent and people will have greater encounters with them. The angel shows up. He's observing Gideon in this condition. Gideon is a farmer that would farm the wheat. The angel shows up and says to Gideon, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. The Lord called him something that he himself couldn't see. The Lord said, you are when he thought he was. 
Several years ago before the pandemic, I preached a message with this thought in it. There is a you that's on the inside of you that you don't know that's in you. There was a person inside Gideon that he didn't know was inside Gideon. He thought he was a farmer. He didn't see himself as a warrior. He saw, he saw himself as somebody hiding from his enemy, much less fighting his enemy. And the angel showed up and said, the Lord is with you. Somebody say, he's with me. He's with me. Said, the Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. Told him you're going to save Israel from the hands of the enemy. You're going to be used by God to defeat the enemy that you're hiding from. The very thing that you're trying to go undetected by is I'm going to use you to actually defeat it. So many Christians right now are trying to live their life as if they're unaware of what's happening in culture. Let's just ignore it. I see it out of my peripheral vision, but I'm not going to look at it or acknowledge it I'm going to try to pretend like it's not there and I'm going to hope that somehow it doesn't show up at my house. It doesn't disrupt my life. It doesn't somehow do something to me. Not realizing we're being taken captive by it as it's surrounding us and moving in closer to us. And so Gideon is being confronted by God. The Lord is with you, you mighty man of valor. I'm going to use you to destroy the enemy, Israel's enemy. I'm going to use you to destroy them. Somebody say, God's going to use me. And Gideon, his reply is, well, if the Lord's with me, then why have all these things happened? Don't you know who I am? Don't you know what family I come from? Don't you know where the neighborhood I grew up in? He blames somebody else for his condition. People are full of excuses today of why they can't. The way I, I'm the way that I am because of somebody else. I'm the way that I am because of my parents or my dad or my mom or my community or where I came from or my lack of education or what somebody had treated me like one time in my life or something a school teacher said to me. I can't because of them. We live in a world that's filled with excuses and now we have a community, a culture in our world where we feed you labels so that you can embrace the reason you are the way you are. I'm this way because they did this. I'm this way because of that. I'm this way because of my mom. I'm this way because my mother was a teenager when I was born. I'm this way because my dad abandoned me. I'm this way because I did drugs when I was a kid. People gave me alcohol and weed when I was a child. I'm this way because of that. We live in a world where everybody's blaming other people for the way they are. And our culture is feeding that. They're they're inviting people across our border, handing them, handing them money, giving them cards. Saying, here, here's a plane ticket. Here, here's you a here's you a charge card. Giving you don't worry about anything. We'll give everything to you. Not realizing that it's a slave mentality that they're instilling inside people. When you live for a handout, you're stepping into the trap. You're stepping into something that's going to control you. It's going to dictate the terms of how you live, the level in which you live. Gideon was hiding just trying to get by. God didn't call you just to get by. God didn't call you to go undetected. God didn't call you just to try to make it through life, hoping that nobody notices or it just doesn't disrupt certain things. We're called to disrupt. 
We're called to break the system, to break the cycles, to disrupt culture. We're called to push back. We're not called to go with the culture. We're called to go counterculture. That's what the angel was saying. Everybody else was living like you're living. I've called you to live another way. And he says, well, if God is with me. And that's what everybody says. Now, the young lady that came up here and described what happened to her father, I understand. I'm not, please hear me really well. I'm not about to pick on you because of what you said. But I want to address that mindset because I hear it so often. So often people say, well, if God is with me, then why then? Why did this happen to my dad? Why did this happen to my, why did my, why did my kids get on drugs? Why are they doing heroin? Why did they end up in prison? If God is with me, then, you know, why did, why did somebody rip me off and take my money? If God is with me, then why is there cancer? If God is with me, then why is this happening? That's what he was saying. Gideon was saying, well, if God is with me, then why then? Why did this happen? You can find a million why thens why you shouldn't be who God says you are. If you're looking for a reason why you shouldn't be what God says you are, the enemy's going to sit there and feed them to you all day long. He'll feed you. He'll feed you. What he tries to feed me may not be what he tries to feed you, but he'll feed you all day long what he thinks that you want to hear so that you'll justify why you're not. I'm not because of, I'm not because of. And so Gideon was saying all of these reasons, well, if the Lord's with me, then why then? And then there's that moment where Gideon came to himself. He realized that the, I, was being, I am being confronted by God and by this angel. I'm being called to rise up and to step up to another level. I'm being called to go all in. The way you break anxiety, the way you break addiction, the way you break is all in. The way you get into freedom is all in. It's immersing yourself. You're not called to Christianity as a side thing. It's not something we go and do, it's how we live. We don't treat Christianity like a side chick. You don't need a side chick, period, but for lack of terminology to help some of you with terminology you do understand. It's him and him alone, it's all in. So in this commitment to all in, Gideon's being confronted and God uses him. God uses him to go out and ultimately defeat the enemy. He rallied up an army and God said, that's too many because the ones that are with you are not really ready for the battle that you're about to face. So I need to get rid of some of them have them go down there and drink from the water and I'll show you the ones that you're to choose. And then when he saw the ones that responded the way that God said they would respond, that number was drastically reduced. He told the other ones, go back home, you're not ready. That's a church growth model most are not ready for. Most pastors are not ready to say, you're not ready. Go back home till you get ready. Because where we're going, you're not ready to handle it. Because the fight we're about to get into, you can't handle it. Not because you can't handle it, it's just you didn't prepare yourself to handle it. Because you can handle it if you prepare to handle it. But if you're not preparing yourself to handle it, it will run you over, take you captive, lay, leave you laying dead in the floor if you're not ready for the battle that we're about to fight. We're already fighting it. 
We've been fighting it if you didn't know it. We've been fighting something. Ever since the pandemic, we've been fighting something. Not every moment's a battle. There's been joy. There's happiness. I'm happy over what happened today. I'm blessed over what happened today. I got joy over what happened today. People getting saved, delivered, healed, miracles, signs and wonders. We're punching the devil right in the face. Saying, take back what you're trying to put on somebody. Let it come back up on your head. And so God used Gideon to defeat the enemy. It was supernatural. And God is going to use you and use us to defeat the enemy. It's going to be supernatural. The angel, the angel said to Gideon, go in this strength of yours. He's given you strength. We act like we're so weak, but he's given us strength. He said, you are a mighty man of valor. You are. Quit looking at yourself based off of where you've been. Don't you know who my dad is? Don't you know where I grew up? Don't you know the home that I grew up in? Don't you know where I came from? You know how many times I've been in rehab? You know how many times I've gone bankrupt? You know how many times I've lost my house, lost my car, got repoed? Do you know how many times... Quit looking at where you came from. Quit looking at what happened to you. Quit looking at those things. So there was a shift in the way Gideon thought and there was a shift in the way he saw himself. That's why the scripture says you have overcome the wicked one. Even before you fought him, you have He said, young men, you have overcome the wicked one because the word of God abides inside of you. I'm telling you this. If this is the only place your Bible is, is in between the pages of the cover, it will not defeat the enemy that comes in your life. But you take this word and get it on the inside of you and let it come alive in you. Don't just fill your head with it. Fill your life with it. Become one with it. Let it come alive on the inside of you. Let it affect the way you think, the way you live, the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you love, the way you care. You watch what happens when that comes on. Young men, you have overcome. What's trying to overcome you? You're overcoming it. Why? Because the Word of God abides on the inside of you. What's happened over the last several years to those that fell away and to those that were lukewarm, complacent is that they really had no vision. They had vision for their own dreams. They got saved. Oh, let me give a dream out here. Oh, look at this dream. God's gonna, we we try to use God for our own dream. But when you really go after God, God will put a vision inside of you that comes from Him. When you die to yourself, you'll begin to live a life that you could never imagine that you'd live. And the vision you have will be like fire shut up on the inside of your bones. It'll wake you up in the morning. You'll try to get lazy for a few days, but there'll be fire on the inside of you that won't let you stay there. You may get discouraged periodically, but there's a fire inside your bones that won't let you stay down. There's a vision that comes from God as a result of seeking God. Proverbs 29, 18 says where there's no vision, people wander off. They have no restraints. That's why you have so many, so many simping saints that have turned into alcoholic saints. They got too drunk with wine and no longer are they filled with the spirit. Now wine controls them And the Spirit has no control over them. That's why so many saints have wandered outside of their marriage and ended up in adultery because they had no restraint. They had no vision. When you understand who you are in God, when you're pursuing Him, when you're connected to Him, when you walk with Him, He puts something on the inside of you. When the devil tries to show up, When the devil tries to tempt you, 
when the devil tries to offer you something, you catch it, you smell it. I smell that devil. I, you catch it. You catch it as soon as it shows up. And you render yourself dead to it. I'm dead to that. I'm dead to that. I'm not alive to that. There's no place in me for that. Down in sin. You lay down in the flesh. You lay down in carnality. But when you seek God and you realize and you're awakened to destiny, and destiny isn't always this big thing that we think that, oh, my name's going to be... If you think destiny's about your name being in lights, and I'm not saying that he doesn't make some people's names famous, because the scripture says he makes people's names famous. But it's never about you. If it's all about you, I want to be in lights. I want to have all eyes on me. You're not ready. It's still about you. It needs to be about the kingdom. It needs to be about our king. It needs to be about Jesus. It needs to be less of us and more of him. Nothing wrong with platforms. I hope everybody gets big ones. I hope you have millions of eyes looking at you. But when they look at you, you need to say, ladies and gentlemen, now that I have your attention, I must decrease and he must increase. So in this moment where, where Gideon was awakened that I'm a warrior, I'm not a farmer. There was something hiding in him that he didn't know was in him. You would have looked at me skateboarding, smoking weed, doing coke, partying, getting arrested. You would have never looked at me when I had blue black hair, skull earrings, leather pants, and biker boots. You would have never looked at me and said, there's a preacher. But there was a preacher hiding in me. There was a preacher hiding on the inside of me, waiting to be awakened on the inside of me. There's a you on the inside of you that you don't know is on the inside of you. God, God has not brought us this far to allow us to be loyal, lulled to sleep while the enemy runs over the world. I didn't give my life to Jesus to let it end right here. There's a battle that is waiting. There's victories to be experienced. You'll only experience victory when you show up for the fight. When he says that you're victorious, that's because you showed up to the fight, fight that he already preordained that you're going to be victorious over. And so, and so what happens is he's awakened with this vision. And it affects the trajectory of his life. And he gives himself to it. He begins to respond in obedience to it. And it affects everyone else. Every one of us affects somebody else. Every one of us. Men, I want to talk to the men. Men, you're the leader of your house. Statistics show that 80 it's either 83 or 80 six percent, one or the other, of a family will give their life to Jesus if the man will. It drops down to, I think, 30 something. I think it's 38, somewhere around there. 37? I'm impressed. 37 percent, the rest of the family gives her life to Jesus when a woman goes first or a woman is the only one doing it. 
that shows how important you are, man. We have a strong group of men in this church. You know, most churches don't have strong presence of men. Most churches are predominantly, it's the women that make everything happen. That's because the enemy has tricked men. Tricked men from rising up and standing up. The reason men have been tricked because there's a soft gospel that's been preached. We've made the gospel sound like it should come with flowers and dresses versus swords and shields. You give a man To show us who we are in you, Father Lord God, and because in your presence, Father Lord God, we find lift up your voices and pray. In your presence, Father Lord God, we know who we are in you, Father Lord God. So, Father, in Jesus' name, teach us how to use your sword. Teach us how to speak with wisdom and knowledge. God. Lift up your voices and pray. God, give us, Father God, and what you see, help us see through your eyes, Almighty God. Lord God, so help us, God, to take over the land, Father Lord God. In the name of Jesus, help us be men and women of valor, Father Lord God. Help us be fearless, Father Thank Lord God. Thank you, Jesus. And the face of the enemy, Father Lord God. Father Lord God, your word says, Father Lord God, but when I am afraid, I will put my trust in you. So we trust you. We trust you. We trust you, God. Even though we cannot see it, we're going to trust you in the Woo. midst, Father Lord God. Your word says, God, Lord, though we walk in the valley of death, we shall not fear no evil. That your rod and your staff are there to protect me and to guide me, Father Lord God. Lord, so guide us, God. Father Lord God, we are we are that lily in the valley, Father Lord God. That everything that God that is trying to exalt itself, God, Lord, to be brought low, Father Lord God, in the name of Jesus. Everybody say in the name of Jesus. I receive this word today. In the name of Jesus. Now there are people in this room. You're not ready to meet God. There are people in this room if you were to die today and stand before God, He would not say to you, enter into my joy. He would say to you, be, be separated or cast away from me because I don't know you. If you're not right with Jesus, if you're away from God, if you've gone back into habitual sin, when I count to three, I want you to raise your hand. Don't wait, don't delay, don't put it off. Today is a day of salvation. God will forgive you. God will cleanse you. God will wash all your sins away. But He can only wash away the sins that you repent of, that you confess, and that you ask Him to cleanse you from. On the count of three, lift up your hand. That's you. One, two, three. Raise it up. Raise it up. Lift it up. Keep it up. Keep it up. Every hand, every hand raised, get out of your seat. Every hand raised, get out of your seat. Come up here. Turn me up in these monitors, please. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Come 
bless you, sir. Stand right here. Stand right here. Come on, as people are coming, come on. Come on. You raise your hand, come on. Come on, come to Jesus. I want you to turn to the person beside you. Ask them, do you need to go? If they say yes, say, come on. I'll go with you. And you bring them right now. Ask them, say, come on, I'll, I'll go with you. If they need to be up here. You bring them right now. People are coming. Come on. Get up here. Let's go. So good. God bless you. So beautiful. So beautiful. Anybody else? Here comes, comes two more. These are not the days to be playing around in sin. Not that there ever were days to play around in it. The Bible says if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, pluck it out. Now he's not saying literally go do that. He's figuratively speaking saying deal ruthlessly with your sin. Because if you don't deal ruthlessly with it, it will deal ruthlessly with you. God has given you the power. When you come to Him, He gives you free grace. He gives you forgiveness and it's free. It's free. It's free. We're all going to pray together with these men, these ladies. All of us pray out loud. Say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of all my sins. I repent. I put my faith in you. I want to know you. I want to walk with you. I give you everything. Be my Savior. Be my Lord. Be my Master. I'm yours. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.